I like that comment where they said, you're all here for a, gr- for a real good reason. You're all here for a good reason. Um, when I was about 16 years old, a friend of mine said, do you want to help with church camp? I said, oh yeah, I'm into that. Are there girls? He said, yeah, there's lots of girls. I said, yeah, I'm into that. So I went to church camp. I was not a Christian. I went there because there were girls. I did not go there because of Jesus. I don't know why you're here, but I know I went to a lot of things like this, and it wasn't for Jesus before I was a Christian. But something weird happened to me while I was at these meetings looking for girls. I heard something about God. So whether you're here for the right reason or the wrong reason, it don't make any difference because you're going to hear about God. I'm wearing coffee this morning. You know, I didn't drink coffee this morning, but I'm wearing it. I smell like coffee. It's good. It's like a cologne. But it reminded me of something else I was wearing one day. I came out of the donut shop in Laguna Beach, Florida. And you come out with a little white bag of donuts. Man, they're great. They're handmade donuts, fresh every morning. But the problem is that the, the seagulls are trained to see that white bag. And when they see that white bag, they go, oh, oh, mine, 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 mine. They start following you. And they start making donations. If the wind's just right, they start dropping stuff on you in, in their excitement to see you. So coffee's not bad compared to that. But I was thinking when you get on the beach with the goodies, the birds come. And, you know, we threw seeds, you know, you got the seeds. And I thought, this is what happened in ancient days. You had a guy with a bag, he'd go out and he'd throw seeds, and then he would go, he'd step back, and then you could kind of see the birds start to come in. And it was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. They'd get out there and say, okay, you birds, get out of here, get out of here. That's the way it is when you get some good stuff. Satan comes and tries to steal it away. So the better the stuff, like the seagulls, they come to get it. So the gospel was, here's the deal. You accept and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Good. That he died on the cross and that he was raised again from the dead three days later. I think I got that straight. If you believe that, accept that, and the Bible's the word of God, you've got to have that. People say, well, I don't get into the Bible, I just follow Jesus. I say, I got Jesus Martinez right up the street. You follow Jesus? No, not that Jesus. I saw, I got Jesus as a space alien, it came from the planet Kolob, and he sent Moroni, and they wrote a book. No, not, not that Jesus. So you've got to have a way to tell who the Jesus is. You've got to have the right Jesus. Now, you remember when I prayed, I heard a voice, and God said, my son Jesus will show you the way. So what God did for me, I was, somebody asked me, I don't know who asked me, they said, well, did somebody witness to you or lead you to the Lord? I said, no, that never would have happened with me. And the reason was because I was so hard-headed, I was so argumentative, that if anybody ever came to me and said anything, I was Mr. Funny Guy. I was always critical. I was always resisting everything. So it wasn't until I finally lost it completely that God came up. I, I borrowed some jumper cables. Man, I've never seen jumper cables this nice. Mine are all greasy and ratty and torn up. I don't know where they got these things. But what God did was, Lawrence, can you hang on to this other end just for just for help? Uh, don't, don't let the ends touch. They could, you know. But anyway, <clears throat> put on the good, positive side first. What side's positive? Well, anyway, what God did to me was, because I was so dense and so hard-hearted and argumentative, that what God did was, by saying, my son Jesus will show you the way, he basically put spiritual jumper cables. Oh, man. Do I believe in body piercing? Not this morning. oh, oh. oh. Oh, it can't, I can't do it. Okay, I was going to try to do that. Maybe I can try it on you later. God put spiritual jumper cables on me and gave me a jolt. And my, my mind came alive, and all of a sudden I knew, Lawrence, hang on to these things for me. All of a sudden I knew that God existed. Here's the trouble I ran into. You've seen people use jumper cables, right? Okay, when you get done, what do you do? You take them off, you put them away. But here's what I did, spiritually, so to speak. They worked so good, I just left them on the battery, right? And I closed the hood, and everywhere I went, I dragged my jumper, jumper cables. Power failure. Jumper cables, hey, we need power.
power down. Good thing it wasn't last night. We're back up. Maybe we're back up. The power is with us. Yes. Okay. We're good. I ran into a major problem as a Christian. I had this God talking to me, and then I had the Bible. But there's the problem. If you're a Christian and God can talk to you anytime you ask him a question, why do you need a Bible? Let's say, for example, I say, Lord, should I get this job over there at the McDonald's? Yes. Okay, no problem. Lord, should I get up in the morning? Yes. Should I go to sleep now? Yes. Should I marry that cute girl? Absolutely not. No way. Can I get another opinion? So if you've got God talking to you all the time, you don't need a Bible, right? I mean, why would you need a Bible? You don't need a Bible. So that's how, anybody ever hear of Jim Jones? Well, they had a cult. There was like 900 people that drank poison Kool-Aid and died in 1978. But the way he started off doing this was he said first to them, he said, do you need a Bible? Do you need a Bible? And they're like, yeah. He said, no, you don't. And he took his Bible and he threw it down. And he said, you don't need a Bible anymore because God talks to me and I will tell you what he's telling us. Now that day, they had about 3,000 people in that church, and that day about 1,000 people left. But 2,000 people stayed. Out of that 2,000 people, 1,000 people moved to what was known as Jonestown, and he finally ended up talking them into all killing themselves. 900 people drank, not Kool-Aid, but Flavor-Aid that was poisoned, and they all died. A lot of them were shot, too. So if you've got an understanding like I did, which was very confusing, I had the jumper cables, yes, God spoke to me, but what am I going to do with the Bible? If God can answer you all the time, you don't need a Bible. And there's lots of churches like that, for example. Now, when I talk about different churches, I'm not trying to act superior. I'm not saying they're bad people. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to say we're better, they're bad, whatever. I'm not saying... I'm just using them for an object lesson, for example. You know, just... Because people always say, well, we always think you're better than all those other groups. Okay, look. In, the, in the, the Roman Catholic Church, they have the belief that the Pope can speak from God anytime he wants. And that's considered as good as the Bible. Okay? It's just the way it is. In the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS Church, they have what's known as a prophet. And he can speak anytime he wants, and it's considered as good as the Bible. I'll give you an example. When Joseph Smith came along, he was the first prophet. He spoke and he said that men should marry multiple wives. He got in a lot of trouble over that one, especially with his first wife, Emma. He taught that God told him that you should have multiple wives. Well, then the government got down on that. So about 50 years later, another prophet had a revelation in the Mormon church. He said, now skip that multiple wives thing. Now there's discussion, serious discussion in the Mormon church now about going back to the multiple wives. They're not doing that publicly, but they're actually talking about it. Now if you've got a church where they can just have a prophet and he says, thus says the Lord and it's instant word of God, sky's the limit on that stuff. Same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not down on Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not saying we're better than Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm just saying this is how they operate. In the Watchtower magazine, the word comes from the sixth floor in Brooklyn, New York, out of the governing body. And the governing body makes pronouncements. They said the world was going to come to a complete end in 1914. Oops, missed that one. Then they said 1917. Then they said 1925. They gave up on it for a while. The last prediction was the world was coming to an end in 1975. Watchtower Magazine. Oops, missed that one. Had two Jehovah's Witness elders come in. I said, oh, you're the guys that said the world was coming to an end in 1975. He said, not exactly. He said it would be the end of human history. I said, okay, 1975 was the end of human history. What have we been having since then? Post-history? Unhistory? No history? Anyway. What I'm getting at is that I was a basket case on this one. I had an open door of vulnerability to Satan because of this idea. I laid down a map on the floor in 1978. I looked at the map and I said, I see God wants me to go to 
Laguna Beach, Florida. So off I went July 1st, 1978 on foot. I felt like God told me that I, check this out. I was in Birmingham, Alabama at a rescue mission. Don't ask, okay? I was at the rescue mission and we were in the bathroom and we we're talking about the Lord and I had this guy give me a prophecy. He says, thus says, he's, actually he said, thus says the Lord. Because his two front teeth were out. I said, brother, don't you miss your two front teeth? He said, not really. He says, without the two front teeth, I'm not so much a temptation to the sisters. <laughs> I said, praise God. You're not tempting to the sisters for sure. But in that bathroom, two o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, handsome guy, except for the two front teeth. He said, thus says the Lord, Brother Don, the Lord is going to bring a wife to you within one year. Amen. Praise God, I thought. This is great. I was like getting old, you know. Living in a tent, had a backpack, didn't think anybody would want to marry me, right? Well, that came true within a year. Within a year, I had a wife. So see how I'm, how I'm operating? I'm getting a word. In fact, I felt like God told me, this woman, you want to marry this woman. This is the one for you. And I asked her dad, I said, can I marry her? He said, absolutely not. I said, oh, now I'm really shocked. He has to get a word. I told my wife-to-be, I said, God wants us married. She said, ha, I'm not sure about that. So I had all kinds of problems like this. In fact, I want to tell you a really bad story. A true story. I felt like God told me that a girl had drowned in Lake Michigan, and I was to go there and raise her from the dead. Yeah. So I drove my Buick LeSabre, which I still owned, Bad muffler, got a ticket for it. My beautiful saber driving in faith. I get to Lake Michigan, and I look out at Lake Michigan where I was, where I was led to go, and I saw these huge, it was night, and there was these huge dredges digging up the sand out there. And I said, ah, oh, they're police dredges. They're out there dredging for the dead body of the drowned girl. I felt like God said, you're going to walk on the water, you're going to go over to where the girl is, and you're going to go down. I was a pretty good swimmer. Go down, you're going to bring the girl up from the bottom, you're going to bring her to the shore, you're going to raise her from the dead. So, off I go. I'm out of my car, I'm down to the beach. One little problem. I start going down into the water. The water is really cold. I said, not to worry, I get another word. I'm going to go down, walk on the bottom, I'm going to suck in water like a fish and blow water out like a fish and I'll be able to breathe water. All I have to do is when I get to the water, I'll take a deep breath as deep as I can and suck in as much water as I can, and then I'm going to blow it out. What do you think would have happened? I'd be dead. I'd be dredged. I got down, I started thinking, wait, 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 wait. I had, you know, like your dashboard on your car, it has a beep, beep, beep. Nah, that doesn't mean anything. Beep, 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 beep. I got a warning signal like something's wrong here. I stopped and I... In the water, I'm looking around. I said, these aren't police dredges. These aren't police dredges. These are dredges because the nuclear power plant's right here, and they're keeping the channel open so the water can flow out so that things can stay cool. There's no police here. There's no dead body. This is all a trick. I could get killed with this. Now, I never realized all this goof-up stuff until somebody said, Brother Don, you really ought to write down your testimony and get your story written down. So I'm thinking... Yeah, right. I'm going to write this down. So one day I said, okay, I'm going to start writing this down. I start writing this down. And I start coming across these stories, remembering these stories of these things that happened to me. And I'm thinking, man, i got to hide this thing. This is embarrassing. This is terrible. This is horrible. This is not going to be something that's going to encourage people. It's going to, they're going to say, man, what an idiot. I'm trying to think, where can I hide this? But then I started realizing, I said, wait. Maybe something's going wrong with my Christianity. Maybe I've got an open door where I can be deceived. You think? So then I start listening to Christians everywhere. I start hearing things like, I don't feel led, Brother Don, to be part of that ministry. Or, God told me the other night that... I said, wow. Somebody says, I feel a burden about such and such. Or, I just don't feel peace about that. I said, you know, that's all the same stuff. You know, we talk about the Pope, we talk about Jehovah's Witnesses, we talk about LDS prophets... 
and to me. And I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh, is God really speaking to me? Now, I have to tell you something. When God said, my son Jesus will show you the way, that was so clear and so different than all the other impressions that I got. Those were, I don't know, I wasn't quite sure. Maybe it was God, maybe it wasn't. Very confusing. I thought, well, maybe I'm just imagining this. Maybe I actually have a demon talking to me. You know, picture the angel on the shoulder over here and the devil on the shoulder over there, and I'm just like, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. One time, I felt like God told me I was going to, before I married my wife, I don't know how many revelations you guys have had about who you're going to marry, but I had several. Sorry. See, I have to admit that. It's embarrassing to have to admit that. I had a revelation one time I was going to marry this woman, and she had the same revelation too. So, you know, it's working out, right? One big problem, she's married. But don't worry, we had a revelation he was going to die any minute now. It's all going to work out. This is really bad, isn't it? Think about this. You can get a revelation for anything, and people do. And I did. In fact, think about the, almost the world's biggest religion. Christianity is the first biggest religion. You've got everybody that believes in Jesus, the world's biggest religion. You know. The second biggest religion is what? Muslim, that's right, Islam. Okay. Now, Muhammad said he went into a cave and was talking to the angel Gabriel, and he was told that God has no son. That Jesus is not the Son of God. He's just a prophet, peace be upon him. Now, you have to ask yourself, who was he listening to? And then he heard the voice of the archangel Gabriel tell him to fight and slay all the infidels, anyone that believes different than what he's teaching. So what does the Quran, Sirah 5, Sirah 9, teach? Fight and slay the infidels wherever you find them. Now, what spirit was he listening to? So if somebody gets a revelation, they're supposed to kill somebody, what's the deal? This is a big problem. So we've got to be able to test things. Jesus says there'll be false Christs and false prophets. They will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive even God's chosen ones. Later in the New Testament, it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. So there's two ways you can test these revelations or these voices. The first thing is, does the voice go in harmony with the Word of God? That one about marrying that girl was not very harmonious with the Word of God. Like, let's say somebody says, yeah, I know God is not for that, but God told me, the Word of God teaches against that, but God told me it's okay. You hear that all the time. All the time. And the second thing is, uh, one way to test things is, Do they give prophecies? Like, for example, somebody says, uh, such and such is going to happen at a certain time. The Lord told me. And then it doesn't happen. What's the deal with that? Right? You know that in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, let me turn to that a second. It says you're going to ask this question. How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Oh, that's good. I need to be able to figure it out. It says this is how you figure it out. When the prophet speaks and it doesn't come to pass, this is not a word the Lord has spoken. Very simple test. 100% test. Let me give you a couple examples on that. More, uh, the leader of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith, in the Doctrine and Covenants book, section 84, he said that within that generation then living in 1830, there would be a temple built on the western side of the state of Missouri. Pretty simple. We've got a time, we've got a place, we can test this. So I've got two Mormon elders sitting in my house one day, and I say, Elder, let's just say Elder Smith, Elder Wesson, and they're sitting there and we're talking. I said, this is a prophecy of Joseph Smith. Has the temple been built on the western side of the state of Missouri? One says, at the same time, they give an answer. One says yes, one says no, same time. I said, do you guys want to talk about it? Has it been built or not? He says, absolutely not. In fact, they don't even own the property. Okay, so this is a good way to test things. So you say, somebody says, thus says the Lord, you ought to buy a new car. You ought to buy the red car, the Volvo, and whatever. 
and you get there, the car's not even there. What's that? That's a false prophecy. I'm just saying this, no matter what you learn about Jesus, no matter what you have about the Bible, no matter what you learn tonight and have fellowships and churches and everything else, this completely can be undone if you let yourself listen to voices or impressions or dreams or signs. It can be completely undone. Because all of a sudden, yes, the Old Testament says this, the New Testament says this, but you know what God told me? This is what I call the tragic, the gathering card game. It's like a card game. This is a very dangerous thing. And look around you. Everybody's doing stuff like this. You know, ever hear of tarot cards? Tell your future? My grandmother, even though a Christian, would do the horoscope. She'd read the horoscope every morning to figure out what she was supposed to do that day. Palm readers. You got Wicca with magic. They try to tap into unseen natural forces, maybe supernatural forces. <coughs> you got pagan omens. You got charms. I had a friend in the neighborhood. He had three things in his car. He had that little orange, that little horn, that red horn hanging from his rearview mirror. Have you ever seen that? It's like a little horn, Italian horn. He also had a St. Christopher statue on his dashboard and he had a triple a sticker on the bumper he's fully covered to ward off all of the evil eye we're a superstitious people and so when you become a christian it's easy to drag some of this stuff in here signs wonders impressions dreams voices all of this uh, is subjective because is it god or isn't it god it's really hard to tell unless you can test test it to know whether it's god and you test it two ways First, does it go with the Word of God? Is it in harmony with the Word of God? Or is it fight against the Word of God? And secondly, is it true? And a lot of things aren't testable. Like, for example, if I say to you right now, the Lord is telling me something. I got something from the Lord for you. The Lord has told us all to move to Cincinnati in Jesus' name. How would you test it? When do I move to Cincinnati? We got, we, we got Bible Christian... Meetings where you get to the front and the guy lays his hand on your head and he says, move to Cincinnati. Or for me, the word was move to Laguna Beach, Florida. You see how this is an open door to be manipulated? It's really a very dangerous area. I'll give you one quick example of how signs, like say, that's a sign I should do such and such. We had a young girl in our church. And she was told by her parents to stay away from this one particular guy and not to hang out with him. Oh, that reminds me of another story. Yeah. I'm going to tell that story in just a second. A little off track, but you got time, I got time. And this is the last time you'll see me, so if you say bad things about me, I won't hear them because I'll be gone. So. This girl is taking her car and she's driving to the guy, the boyfriend's house. Okay. And she gets in a terrible accident. She flips the car over and she's almost killed. The car is completely ruined. Her brother says to her, You see, that's God. That's a sign telling you you should not have been going to his house. You see? God stopped you. He flipped your car over and told you, Stop. You're going in the wrong direction. She said, It is a sign. She said, It's a sign that God will not let me die until I marry that guy. That's the problem with signs. They're, in, they're too subjective. They're too open to opinion. I had a girl, Assembly of God. She said, God has shown me that I can marry somebody again even though I, my husband's still alive and I'm, I'm divorced from him, but now I can marry. I said, really? How do you know? He said, God gave me a dream. I said, could you please tell me the dream? And she was like, oh, all right. And she tells me this dream. And I say, okay, explain how that dream tells you that it's okay to get married again. And she says, well, I don't know. It's just a feeling I got after I had the dream. I said, this is the problem with this stuff. You know, it was all good when I was doing it. You know, I mean, when I felt led or had a burden or didn't feel peace, it all worked out real good. But when somebody else didn't have peace or something, anyway, it gets really weird. Here's the difference. You've got subjective, which is the signs and the dreams and the voices and the impressions, subjective, open to interpretation. You can very easily get manipulated by that stuff whether it's a demon or your own imagination or maybe other people speaking words into your life. Very easy to, very subjective. It's like somebody says, what's the temperature of the pool in your backyard? And you, you go in, you go, ah, temperature is just right. 
That's subjective. I said, no, 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 no. I asked you, what is the temperature of the pool? Drop a thermometer in there. Ah, it's 78 degrees. That's objective. You've measured it. If you go in the pool and you say, ah, it's just the right temperature, that's subjective. That's up to opinion. So the problem with signs and impressions and voices and dreams and fortune cookies is they're too subjective. They can't give you solid guidance. But if you allow that stuff and don't know how to discern that stuff, then you're a sitting duck, duck for all this stuff. I'll give you an example. I didn't forget that story. I wasn't going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you now. I was a uh, Christian for like, I don't know, two years or something. Didn't know anything about the Bible. Absolutely nothing about the Bible. And I was in, in my house, and I was reading the book of Galatians, and I was reading this list. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I said, wait, 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 wait. What's that word? Fornication. Fornication. I've never heard that word before. I had a dictionary. I looked it up. Fornication. F O. Sex between two unmarried people. What? My dad taught me that if the girl said yes and you said yes, it was yes. In fact, when I went to church camp, he actually gave me a, a bag of condoms and he said, I expect you to use them. I had a bad upbringing. I, I wasn't raised like all you church kids. When I was 14, my dad said, hey, do you know about the birds and the bees? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, I'm going to bring you to a prostitute in Chicago and I'll teach you. You'll you learn all about it. I said, Dad, I don't, I don't need to know any of that stuff. I already know all that stuff. I was lying because I was scared. I mean, the rest of you, you know, had a good upbringing. My upbringing wasn't so good. So here I am reading Galatians chapter 5, and it says adultery, fornication, uncleanness. That's fornication. Sex between two unmarried people? No way. That's wrong. It says those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. What? My girlfriend knocks on the door. We're going to church. I said, you better come in here. We've got to talk. My girlfriend, you know, which I'm having, -hoo -hoo -hoo. we're going to church and we're doing the thing. I said, look, look at this verse. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness. I said, fornication, I just looked it up. It means sex between two unmarried people. We're doing that. She said, no, we're not. I said, whew, that's a relief. I thought we were. She said, no, that doesn't really apply to us. I said, why doesn't it? He says, she said, because we're in love and we're really married in our hearts. Oh, I said, that's good. That's good. Very creative. Very creative. I like it. I said, but uh, I, I, I love you too, but I don't really think we're married in our hearts. She says, we're not married in our hearts? Uh oh I blew it. She said, hey, look, if you don't want to do anything like that, I said, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't want to do anything. I didn't say that. I'm just saying it says that if you do that, you're going to hell. Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the way the Bible puts it, a little more polite than hell. She says, well, whatever. So I started studying that fornication thing, and I looked through the Bible. You know, it's mentioned almost on every page. It's like 40 times in the New Testament. It's like a big problem with Gentiles. And you know what? We are Gentiles. You got a Jew here? I don't know. Praise God. So I finally repented of it. I had a long story. Oh, boy. So I went to church one night, Wednesday night. Did anybody want to say anything? Yeah, I got something to say. I said, I'd like to confess the sin of fornication. Man, that place was quiet. <laughs> a lady that I didn't know then, but I got to know her better later, was there in that church that night, Wednesday night. I always want to confess sins with a small crowd, you know. Wednesday night. I said, well, what did you think of that? She said, well, I leaned over to my friend and I said, what is fornification? She'd been raised a Baptist her whole life but never heard of fornification. The Bible talks a lot about not having sex outside of marriage. But I was ready to get a revelation that was okay. And my girlfriend was well ready to get over it. She already had the answer. She had the revelation already. We were in love, and we were married in our hearts. 
But that doesn't work. You see, there's the battle. There's the struggle. Is it the word of God you're going to go by? Or is it going to be a feeling? Nothing more than feeling. Ever since I've met you. <laughs> feelings of love. That was my best line with girls. I said, I love you. I love you you're in love it's okay right no 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 i read that galatians chapter 5 if you don't believe me check it out so the word of god is solid 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 and it's not subjective it's objective that's why i talked about the covenants last night because you go to the old testament it says yeah i can i can eat locusts you know <laughs> you got to have an understanding of the bible so ask yourself if you feel like somebody is leading you or you're being led or whatever Test it by the Word of God. The Word of God is your standard. And then, see if it makes any sense prophecy-wise. Because a lot of times it doesn't. New Testament is clear. I went back to the New Testament. I just had, I apparently missed this. I just went right over it. I read the New Testament, didn't get this. When I read in Acts, it is the Spirit speaks to the church. It was very clear. Go through Acts. Every time it's very clear, very clear. God spoke to Paul. God spoke to Peter. God spoke to John. They had visions. They had the Spirit speak to them. Every time it was crystal clear. Nobody ever said, I feel the Lord is leading me to Caesarea Philippi to speak to a centurion over there that may want to hear the gospel. When Saul was blinded by the light of God, he went into Damascus, and Ananias, a Christian, was spoke to by God. He says, he's my chosen vessel. But what, what do we do? We say, I got the impression, you know, this is what Ananias would say if it was this way, I got the impression, I got a burden for this Saul fellow. And I think I, the Lord is leading me to go over there and lay, maybe to go over there and lay hands on him. You see the difference? The New Testament is very definite. When God spoke to people, they knew it. And when God said, my son Jesus will show you the way, I knew it. I knew it was God. There was no shadow of doubt. But then all this other stuff, like marry this girl or marry that girl or she's hot or whatever, you know, it was kind of maybe it's God, maybe it's not. So I'm worried about you. I'm concerned that what's going to happen is, you know, there's other churches in Lancaster City. There's lots of other fellowships. And, you know, the first thing you want to ask about a Christian, you know, let me back up a second. Here I was, had been an atheist, and became a Christian. Which group should I join? How do I know? Everybody says, oh, join my group. You know, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, you want to come to the Kingdom Hall. How would I know any difference? How would I be able to judge whether I should go to that fellowship or not go to that fellowship? And trust me, it's a competitive thing. You know, everybody's looking for people to be part of their fellowships, no matter what the fellowship is. So how are you going to know the right fellowship to get into? You know how mostly people get to fellowships? Friends. Maybe some activity. Maybe the good food. Whatever. It's coincidence. It's a chance. But you gotta, that's not very uh, objective, though, is it? It's very subjective. So what you want to ask yourself is, first of all, is that Christian group a group that says they want to go by the Bible only? Good question. Because I was in a church, the Episcopal Church, St. Thomas by the Sea, and I said to the vicar, that's what they call the leader there, I said, it looks like a lot of the stuff you're doing here is traditional and not biblical. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And well you do to keep your traditions, but you make void the commandments of God. I said, a lot of traditional stuff going on here. You know what he said to me? He said, this is a traditional church. This is really not a biblical church. This may not be the church for you, he said. I said, I got that message. So right off the bat, if they're telling you, well, the Bible's real good, but it's not been translated real well. That's uh, Article 7 of the Articles of Faith of the Mormon Church. The Word of God has not been translated correctly. Attack the Bible, why? So you can set up your own authorities to lead you instead. Now you've got to go by the man, whoever is getting the paycheck. So I'm afraid for you. 
because just like those seagulls got my donuts, all I did, I set the bag down. I was just going to get some shells, and the seagulls are so smart, they know the goodies are in the bag, they grab the bag and drug it off, and they all of them landed on the bag and start tearing the bag to pieces. This is what, you got the goodies now. You've got the gospel of Jesus. He's the son of God, he died, he rose from the dead, and you believe that. That seed is planted in your heart. It will grow. It will mature. Just like uh, you say a woman is pregnant, right? It begins to grow. Now you're all pregnant with the seed of Jesus. It's not full-grown Jesus yet, but you're all getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Paul says, I fear, little children, as I labor in birth pangs for you until Christ be formed in you. I'm afraid for you lest I've labored in vain, because you might get snatched away like the seagulls. You've got the goodies. Now you've got to fight to defend those seeds that have been planted in your heart. Some point, at some point in your Christianity, you've got to get to the Bible. Because just like me, I didn't have any idea what fornication was. I needed to hear the Word of God at some point. If you keep going by just, God's telling me this or God's telling you that, in fact, I think there was a phone call this morning Somebody said, God told her not to come here this morning. I was witnessing to a guy, he was Mormon. Mormons tell you to pray. And God will give you the burning in the bosom to give you evidence that it's true. Really? Burning in the bosom? Is that subjective or objective? You tell me. It's subjective. Do I feel heartburn or not? Yeah, maybe. So this guy is a Mormon. I talked to him all about Mormonism. An hour later, I'm gone. I get a phone call. He says, you've got to talk to so-and-so. I said, okay, what's going on? This is the guy I talked to about Mormonism. He said he had a voice speak to him just a few minutes ago. I said, great, what could this be? I got him on the phone. He says, God just told me that Mormonism is not true that Joseph Smith is not a prophet and that the Book of Mormon is not true. But I got a problem, don't I? Because what the voice can give, the voice can take away. So what happened next year and the year after that? Another voice, another revelation. You see what happens? It's an open door for deception. Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. I had a friend, he said, he said, I had the Virgin Mary talk to me last night. His name was Danny Shoemaker. I said, you had the Virgin Mary talk to you last night. Really? I said, yes. I said, did she have dark hair and dark eyes and dark olive skin? He said, why no? She had blonde hair and blue eyes. I said, you got the wrong girl. Mary was Jewish. You've got an imposter. He said, yeah, what's with that? She wouldn't be blonde. I said, next time Mary shows up, ask for her ID. We are open to deception. And this stuff sounds very spiritual. But I tell you what, you want to be spiritual, open the book. And a lot of this is going to be hard to understand. You've got men of God and sisters of God, yeah, man of God, sisters of God. You have brothers and sisters that are Christians in here. They'll help you understand this. It's tricky. I mean, if you're not careful, you'll end up eating locusts. But they'll help you understand it. Get a Bible open. It's solid. It's the temperature gauge. It's objective. You'll be able to know the truth, and the truth will really set you free. Amen. everybody. It's been nice to be here. From all our people in Florida, they say, hey, and they're praying for us. And maybe I'll be able to come back. I hope sometime. Thank you for all coming. God bless you.